When I first came here to First Baptist, uh, back from Brazil in 1987 to become pastor, there was a pulpit that was here, and I always talked about the idea that the pastor's job was to help people see Jesus. And so since I said that so much, somebody decided to put that on the pulpit so that when I opened my Bible, there was a verse from John that said, Sir, we would see Jesus. And so for many, many years, I preached here, always reminded that my job was to help people see Jesus. And the beginning of this service really did help me to see Jesus. Did it help you? Amen. Uh, Say these words with me. Jesus is all and is in all. It's Colossians chapter 3. It's a reminder that what makes Christianity work is the fact that it's the only possibility for the human family to find equality. If we start in our race, we run into problems. If we start in our religion, we run into problems. If we start in our culture, we run into problems. But if we start in Jesus, then we start in equality. It's so important that as you live your Christian life, that you always start with Jesus. He is the beginning, and he is the end. And if you'll always start with him, you'll see people correctly. And if you always end with him, you'll treat people correctly. And what we lived here in this church during my lifetime was people were brought to Jesus. One of my favorite authors uh, uh, has gone to heaven many, many centuries ago, named George Fox, was the founder of the Quaker Church. And when someone asked him, how do you disciple people? He said, I take them to Jesus and I leave them there. Isn't that great? I take them to Jesus and I leave them there. They come back and then I take them back again. They come back, I take them back again. Eventually they figure out that's where they really need to stay. Um, I came to this church as a child. I grew up here in Hollywood, in Miramar actually, Southwest 35th Street. Uh, My dad died when I was about 10 years old, and one of my dearest friends would disappear every Sunday. And we always played baseball together, but every Sunday he would just disappear. So finally I figured out that he was going to church. And um, back in those days, this church, back then called First Baptist of West Hollywood, had about 37 buses that the church owned and operated. And they would run those buses out into the community and pick up kids in the poorer neighborhoods of North Miami, Hollywood, all up to Fort Lauderdale. And there was a time when the church, this church brought 1,500 kids in every Sunday morning here. And I was one of those kids. I was completely lost after my dad died. My mom went and got a job at the Diplomat Hotel as a maid. And um, this church just stepped in and adopted me and under the leadership of Dr. Verl Ackerman, first under Dr. Bowers, then Dr. Verl Ackerman, and the young lady who was singing just now is Dr. Ackerman's granddaughter, Celeste. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of history here. And so I came in here and um, was loved and discipled and taken to Jesus time after time after time. I made most of my most important spiritual decisions decisions at the altar here in this building. This building was dedicated in 1972, and I was already married at that time, and um, God did tremendous work. Then we went to Brazil in 1979. This church sent us there. We stayed there for about eight years. Then I came back in 1987 and became pastor of this church from 1987 to 2005. And... This is a very special place. It's a very special place today. It's always been a very special place to me. I remember this building now sits on an area that once was a trailer park, a little small trailer park here. There's always been the cemetery across the street. And uh, West Hollywood meant West Hollywood because it was the end of the world. 
You know, you wonder why they call it West Hollywood. It's because everything out west of here was cow pastures. Nobody ever dreamed they would build houses on that muck out there, far west out there. Nobody ever thought that would happen, but it happened. You know, so for me to be here, Brian, Vicki, uh, and uh, watch your son lead worship and, and see what God is doing here, it's just an affirmation that God continues to work in this place and that he is touching lives and focusing people on Jesus. And for many of you that I haven't seen for a long time, it's been so good to, to see you and Thanks for lying and saying that I haven't changed, I haven't aged. That's okay. That, that kind of a lie is okay because it does good. It's, so keep lying. It'll be good, you know? That's all right. I thought to myself as when Brian gave me the honor, the privilege to come and speak again as one of your missionaries now, um, what we would talk about. And I thought, you know what? If, if I was about to reach the very end of my life, and I was to be talking to my children and grandchildren, or I was talking to people I really cared about, what would I say to them? What would be one thing I would want them to to remember? And this phrase came to my mind, never underestimate Jesus. Can you say that with me? Never underestimate Jesus. Have you ever uh, underestimated something or someone in your life? You ever done that? Uh, When you underestimate something or someone, it can be a great surprise. They're much more than you thought they were. It's worth much more than you thought it was worth. That's fun. But most of the time when we underestimate things, we pay a pretty high price. For instance, have you ever underestimated the cost of a house repair? Anybody ever done that? That's universal, isn't it? I won't cost that much. And then you open up the roof and it's rotten. You know, oh, well, we're just going to fix this little water leak we've got. And by the time they're done tracing it to its source, you've lost four walls in your house. Uh, When we underestimate things, we pay a price. Have you ever underestimated the volatility of home values? Anybody in South Florida know what that is? The old wisdom of my day was... They will, the, the value of your home will always grow at least 6% a year. Any of you remember that wisdom? Do you remember 2008? That wisdom went right out the window. I mean, people thought they could not lose ever any money on a house. Have you ever underestimated the strength of the ocean? Have you ever gone out here to the beach and got caught in one of those riptides? I was with a group of people in El Salvador one time on an evangelistic campaign, a group of singers from Liberty University, and we had about six people nearly drowned because we stepped out into the water, and and that current took us, and there were no pleasure boats, no lifeguards, nobody. It was a miracle of God. We got back to the beach. You ever underestimated the power of wind, a hurricane? You're sitting in your house, and you thought you could weather the storm in the house, and about halfway through, you were praying you could go somewhere. <laughs> Many of you have been through that. Have you, ever, have you ever underestimated a physical symptom in your body, a pain, where it hurt, and you ignored it, it hurt, you ignored it, it hurt, you ignored it, and then one day you couldn't ignore it anymore, and the doctor's first words is, why didn't you come in earlier? You pay a price. Have you ever underestimated the influence of a person in your life? Have you ever had a teenage child that you're raising and watched them get a bad friend or date the wrong guy or the wrong girl, and they can't see it, but you can see it? There is a power in estimating things correctly. And when you estimate things correctly, you win, you gain, you grow. But if you underestimate things, uh, sooner or later, you're going to have to make a major adjustment. And I'd like to kind of put this thought into your mind this morning that uh, there is a price we pay for underestimating people or things. 
But there is an enormous price <clears throat> that we pay if we underestimate Jesus. And I would like to say to you right now that you are losing much more than you realize by daily underestimating who he is. I lose every day opportunities, peace, joy, love, because I do not take him seriously enough in my life. I underestimate him, and I lose. We all know that we can lose things in life, but seldom do we realize the power that comes from underestimating Jesus. I'm not talking about underestimating him on the cross. I'm, I'm going to assume that most of you have properly considered Jesus to be the payment for your sins. Amen? I'm talking about what he is in your daily life. I'm talking about what you lose when you do not remember who it is that's in you. Christ is all and is in all. When you forget that he lives in you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, moment by moment, when you forget, when you give him less credit than he deserves, you lose. But when you believe in him, <clears throat> when you really give him the right value, then you win. I want to show you a passage in the Bible in Matthew 12, verses 1 to 13, where a group of people called the Pharisees, thanks, Brian, you know the angels saw that and there's a gift for you waiting in heaven. That's true. When you see the preacher choking to death, give him water, and a gift awaits you. <laughs> That's the McCord version of the Bible there. Matthew chapter 12, there was a group that was constantly underestimating Jesus. They were called Pharisees. They were the theologians of that day. Now, it's entirely possible that you as a believer can know your Bible from beginning to end, and underestimate Jesus. It's entirely possible that you can be the best church attender in this church and be underestimating Jesus. This is a pro I can be preaching this morning and trying to do the best I possibly can and underestimating Jesus. And this group did, and they suffered great loss. I think this is going to come up on the screen. Let me read it. You can follow along. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered into the house of God and ate the showbread which was not lawful for him to eat nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? And here's what I want you to notice in this next verse. Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. He's talking about himself. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man, Jesus, is Lord even of the Sabbath. The passage continues on, and a little later on, the Pharisees try to trap Jesus, and there's a man who is withered in his body. He has a need of healing, and it happens to be the Sabbath again, and they say, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And he heals the man. And because they were not giving Jesus credit for being greater than the Sabbath, from that moment on, they plotted to kill Jesus. 
there is this thing in us as human beings. We have this tendency to underestimate God. <clears throat> started way back in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve had the option between the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they underestimated the power of a thing called death. They, God said, if you eat of this tree, you will die. And they did not make the right choice. And then later on, Cain underestimates the importance of the right offering before God. He kills Abel. And if you read the whole Bible, everywhere there is a major human failure. It always rests in failing to give God the proper credit and worth. It's always tied to worship. Jesus came so that you and I could stop underestimating God. The Bible says he became flesh and dwelt among us. And we could see the glory of God full of grace and truth. Every single thing Jesus did, did is an invitation for you to get it right. Now, when he had this encounter with the Pharisees, he said, look, one that is greater than the temple is here. They revered the temple. They worshiped in the temple. They thought God was in the temple. And Jesus says, in this physical body you're looking at, I am greater than the temple. He says that his judgment, his ability to make the right choices and let his disciples eat grain on the Sabbath because he was greater than the Sabbath. I don't know if we really understand what it means when the Bible says that Christ is in us. If he is truly the Son of God, and if he is truly greater than the temple, and if he is truly greater than the judgments of men and women, if he is all of this, <clears throat> and he lives in you, I am absolutely certain today you do not have a complete, correct estimation of yourself. You do not really know who you are unless you really know him. I want to tell you something. Jesus is in you. Something greater than the temple in Jerusalem is in you. Something greater than Sabbath-keeping is in you. Something Someone greater than the judgments of men is in you. And I can say this without any doubt whatsoever. I never have lived one single day, 100% correctly estimating the value of the person that lives in me. Because if I did, my depression would really go away. If I really did, my prejudices would vanish. If I really did, my fears would be gone. But God is very patient with us, is he not? He very slowly works with us to raise the level of our awareness of who he is. He knows that we are weak. He knows that we are filled with faults. But he is discipling us. The process of discipleship at times is hard for people to understand what really is discipleship. And I've come to believe that discipleship is nothing more, nothing less than continuous contact with the person of Jesus. I used to think that it was continuous contact with the words of the Bible, but I've, I've come to believe that the Bible is trying to take me to Jesus. I like to think of the Bible like a GPS. Everybody here know what a GPS is? You know, that's that thing that your kids are used to because they grew up with it, but you as an older adult, you go, I can't believe a machine exists that takes me where I'm supposed to be if I just listen to it. 
your kids think this, this thing's been around since eternity past. You know, and it's harder when you're older to get used to this stuff that your kids know how to do better than you, but that's just the way it is. I believe that every, if you open the Bible in Genesis and read Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3 is like a GPS. Written into every verse in the Bible, the address that it's trying to get you to is Jesus. Doesn't matter where you start, you can read in Leviticus, you can read in Psalms, you can read in. What it's trying to do is get you face to face, face with the way, the truth, and the life. And that's a person. It's not a geography, it's a person. When Jesus was discipling his first disciples, how did he do it? What was the process he used? Do you know that the first disciples never went to a class? You know, the first disciples never had a PowerPoint presentation given to them. The first disciples didn't even get a diploma. Their discipleship process was very simple. They would wake up in the morning open their eyes, and look for him. I can imagine the discussion in the morning when they woke up where they were walking with Jesus for three and a half years. Where'd he go? Uh, He went to pray. How long do you think he'll be gone? Ah, you know, nobody controls him. He'll be back when he's ready. Well, what are we supposed to do until then? Well, we're just going to wait. You really think we ought to just wait? Yeah, I think so. He'll be back. And after a while, he would come back, and they would look and say, there he comes. And then they would listen to him. And then they would walk with him. And every moment they walked with him, he was changing their perception of God. It took three and a half years for the first group to even begin to get close to understanding who he was. It took three years before they could answer the question, who do men say that I am? And Peter pipes up and says, you're the son of God. And he said, it wasn't flesh and blood that fixed that estimation. It was God. And I'll build my church on that one, he said. And he's been building it ever since, amen? So they woke up, they saw him, they heard him. And then he finally fell in love with him. It took a long time. They made a lot of mistakes. In the book of John, and I'm going to go through this really quickly, but it's really, really beautiful when you see it, how patient Jesus was with them. Because when they first started following him, I think they probably thought he was just a great teacher. I really do. I think most of them thought that he was going to teach Israel to be Israel, and he maybe would be a revolutionary and throw off the yoke of Roman oppression. And I don't think they really understood what he was after. And a lot of times in our lives, we don't understand either, right? We don't know why he lets certain things happen. We don't know why he leads us into the messes sometimes we find ourselves in, or we don't understand why he sticks with us even though we don't deserve for him to be with us. But that's how he disciples people. When Jesus, in the book of John, was discipling his first disciples, John tells us about seven things that he did that changed their perception of him. We won't have time to go into each one, but I want to talk about each one briefly. Um, In John chapter 2, Jesus turns water into wine. How many of you know that story? You know, he goes to the wedding and um, big party, Man, when you mess up somebody's wedding, that's a big deal, isn't it? As a pastor, I've always had this, I have these nightmares every now and then. And there's two nightmares that I have. One is, I forgot that I'm supposed to be at a wedding. Have you ever had that nightmare? I think every pastor has. And all of a sudden, I'm in a panic because I'm supposed to be marrying somebody at the church, and I'm an hour away in South Miami, right? And I'm having this panic. The other is, I'm supposed to be at somebody's funeral, and you wake up in a sweat, and you go, thank God, that was just a nightmare. And then you look at your, you know, your, your iPhone or whatever to see, do I have a wedding today? Maybe that's what's going on, right? He's at the wedding. It's a party. 
involves wine. I'll let you debate what kind of wine, but apparently it was of different qualities at least because they were really smart. They would serve the best stuff first. So if everybody was a little bit too happy, they wouldn't notice that it was getting of a poor quality as the day went along. And he, Mary, his mother comes and she's trying to get him involved in the ministry, I think, like a good mom. And he said, ah, woman, this is not my time. You don't understand who I am, but um, let me help. And he goes and he fixes the problem. And at that moment, his disciples learned something about Jesus. This man can fix human mistakes. How would you like to have somebody in your life that can fix your mistakes? How many want that? He's there. He can. Uh, When you mess up, don't plan well. How many of you have had an experience where God bailed you out of something? Raise your hand right here. Okay. Have you learned a few things by that? Okay, that's your discipleship. That's not a course at a Bible college. That's a course you have at the wedding. That's a course when you bought the wrong house at the wrong time. That's the course when you made a big mistake. There was another story in John chapter 4 where there was a nobleman's son, and um, his son was dying. And it was the most horrifying, scary moment in this man's life. And he leaves his son at home. His son is at death's door, but he's heard that Jesus can do remarkable things. And he finds Jesus, and he wants Jesus to come with him, to go with him to heal his son. And Jesus won't go. And the disciples are watching all of this. And he said, look, go home. Your son is well. And the guy goes, no, no, you you need to come with me. He goes, no, go home. Your son is well. And so he takes off, headed for home, and on the way, he runs into some of his servants who are trying to find him, and they say, your son is well. And he says, "When, when, when did he get better? When did he start? And he said, it was at this hour. And he made the calculation, and he said, it's exactly the moment when Jesus said, your son is well. Now, the disciples are watching all of this, and um, they're learning something else about Jesus. He can fix human error, and he is more powerful than time and space. He can speak in one place, and something else happens in another place. How many of you have ever prayed for someone that is thousands of miles away in the name of Jesus and they were touched. Raise your hand. That's your discipleship. You're beginning to understand this man, this one who abides in you, can uh, fix your mistakes. This man can go across countries, go across distances, and touch people. There's another story a little, a little further into the book of John where there's a man who's at the pool of Bethesda. And there apparently was a time every year when there was some sort of movement in the water, an angel, and the person who got into the water first was cured. And Jesus goes to that pool, and he finds this man who's been 38 years a prisoner in his own body. And he asked him, do you want to be well? And he says, I do, but I'm not fast enough. Every time the angel comes and touches the water, there are people that are too quick, and I just, I don't get there. I can't compete. And Jesus says, "Uh, rise, take up your bed, and go home. His disciples are watching this, and they learn something about Jesus that uh, no disability is permanent with him. Maybe you're here this morning and you have fought an addiction, a fear, 
a hatred for 38 years. Well, I want to tell you that the one who is in you can come whenever he wants to. When you're ready, and he's there at the right moment, and you're ready, and he's ready, and say to you, that is no longer a problem in your life. Now, he doesn't do it for everybody that same way. He just wants you to know that he can do that. Some people live their entire life, one day at a time, dealing with it. Other people, so we'll know that he can, can be healed instantaneously. There are different paths for different people. The book of John goes on, and uh, then he has 5,000 people who need to eat. You remember that story of the five loaves and the fishes? His disciples are watching this. And uh, he takes those five loaves and two fishes, and he feeds everybody. And his disciples are going, man, can you believe he just did that? He is greater than hunger. Have you ever been so hungry for something that you thought you were going to die? For comfort, for love, for forgiveness, for wisdom. And he took something really, really simple and he gave it to you, multiplied it, and you woke up and you go, I'm okay. I'm okay. When my dad died when I was 10, I became a Christian here at First Baptist at age 16. But I was so hungry for male affirmation. I was so hungry to be affirmed by men and thought well of by men. And a man needs that in order to be fully formed. But you know what? Jesus became that man in my life and, that, and through the pastors and deacons of this church. When I was about 35 years old, I was pastor here already. And I woke up one day and I said, I'm not hungry for that anymore. Because he took people, five people, seven people, and did a miracle in my life. And he discipled me. I now believe that Jesus can satisfy every human hunger. That's what he was teaching them. He goes on a little bit more. Uh, he's, they're out in the boat, and uh, Jesus comes walking on the water. Remember that story? Can you imagine where their theology went on that day? I mean, they've seen him turn water into wine. They've seen him, you know, heal the nobleman's son. They've seen him uh, raise the man from 38 years in the prison of his body. But, hey, walking on the water, this is another category of power. And they learned that day that Jesus can walk over the circumstances of our life. The circumstances don't dominate him, and therefore the circumstances should not generate fear in us. That's your discipleship. How many of you have ever been in a place where the circumstances of your life looked like they were going to drown you, but you're here this morning and you're still alive? Say amen. That's your discipleship. That, you don't learn that in a class at Sunday school. You learn that when your business goes under. You learn that when the company you work for goes out of business in South Florida. You learn that when the neighborhood goes crazy and the value of your home drops 100% to almost nothing. You learn that when you're in the hospital and the circumstances look like they're going to overwhelm you. You learn that not through a theological discourse. You learn that with Jesus appearing greater than your circumstances. Then he goes on a little bit more. He meets a blind man who was born blind. You remember that story? And he walks up to him and he helps him to see. And the disciples are watching that and they're going, can you believe that he can take somebody who was born blind and just by looking at them, talking to them, touching them, they can see? How many of you have had an experience about being blind about yourself your whole life and Jesus opened your eyes and revealed to you that you are precious in his sight. Say amen. That's your discipleship. All of us are blind about something. All of us are blind about probably many things. But he is in you, 
And at the right moment, he will open your eyes. And you will see things you've never seen before. That's how he disciples us. Now, this has gone on from chapter 1 of John, chapter 2 of John. Now we're up to about chapter 11. And he comes to the final demonstration for them. And uh, his good friend Lazarus dies. You know that story. And he hangs around for a couple of days. He doesn't go running there to heal him. And finally, he gets up and goes, let's go. We need to go see Lazarus. He gets there. One of the sisters says, he's gone. Why weren't you here? She didn't understand Jesus. She didn't know who she was dealing with. He loved her deeply, but she was still pretty blind about who he really was. And he says, take me to where he's at. And he goes, no, don't. We, no, we don't even need to go there. His body probably stinks by now. I mean, she's in the reality of death. And Jesus says, roll the stone away. You can imagine the panic. No, don't do that. It's already sad enough that he died. You want to disturb his tomb? You want to, you want to, all of us have to deal with seeing a deteriorated corpse? What are you thinking? And then he says, Lazarus, come forth. And he comes out of the grave. Now, he didn't do that for everybody. Why did he do it? Because they needed to see who he really is. And that's what he's doing with you. God is not going to do the same thing in all of our lives the same way. But what he's going to do is he's going to move your estimation of him incrementally at the speed that you can go until you begin to get before him and you do what they did at that day. They said, our Lord and our God. A dead man is alive. But it's really interesting. All of these miracles, water into wine, the healing of the nobleman's son, the walking on the water, he is manifesting his power over death because human error is the fruit of death. We make mistakes because we sinned back in Eden. Our children dying is the fruit of death. We all will have to die, including our children. But if you've got Jesus, then you, don't have to, you do not have to be afraid of death. We just sang that, didn't we, Mark? We just sang that. Death, oh, where is your sting? Grave, where is your... We just sang that. Why? Because Jesus is greater than death. I want to encourage you this morning that if you want to be a disciple of Jesus and really, really, really live Jesus, I want you to understand something really important. The quality of your Christian life is dependent on how well you see him for who he really is. I've been practicing now for a number of years uh, a spiritual discipline that maybe can help you. And before we read one more passage, I want to I wanna just give this to you. Maybe it will be good for you, maybe not, but I want to give it to you and you see if it fits with you. Whenever I'm afraid, whenever I'm depressed, Whenever I am critical, whenever I am argumentative, whenever I am condemning, whenever I am angry, I now understand that those things are telling me I am underestimating Jesus. And so... If I'm being argumentative with Pam, we've been married almost 44 years, and once in a while she makes a little mistake and I get mad at her. Meaning I judge her, I condemn her, I find fault in her. And, and I start getting a little intense. Scotch-Irish blood in me gets intense. All I have to do to stop that 
I used to try to really not do that. I used to say, I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to be harsh with her again. And and that doesn't work. What I want to do, I don't do. And that which I don't do, I don't do. It doesn't work. But I found this to be a cure, immediate cure. I'll say to Jesus something like this. Jesus, because he lives in me. I said, Jesus, do you want me to continue this argument? What was the answer? How, How did you know that answer? In 44 years of marriage, he never one time said to me, yeah, bud, go for it. Not one time. When I'm in traffic in Brazil, and you think you have traffic here, God bless your soul, that is not traffic. That is traffic. In American standards, you guys have bad traffic. Come to Sao Paulo, you'll be kissing the ground when you come back. When I'm in Sao Paulo and I'm in the traffic and I want to call somebody in the other car idiot. Uh, Anybody ever use that spiritual word, idiot? Do you know the Bible says you get close to going to hell if you use that word? And I'm next to that guy who just cut me off and I go, Lord, can I hate him for just a few seconds? Never one time has he ever said, five seconds, bud, hate him for all you're worth. Not one time. When money is short and I don't have the money to pay the bills and I'm really upset and I'm really nervous and I take it to Jesus and say, Jesus, should I be upset about my finances? Not one time has he ever said, boy, but I would be. Not one time. He says, no, I will take care of you. You see, all of the stuff that we fight internally is linked to how powerful we think Jesus really is. And I want to encourage you today. Without being critical of you, without judging you, I I live this too. I just want to say to you, grow every day in your estimation of Jesus toward the goal of understanding that he is all. And the truth will set you free. I want to read a final verse in Colossians, uh, beginning in verse 15. I think this will appear on the screen. Now, this is the person who lives in you. That's right. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the first form from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. And by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of the cross, of his cross. I want to give you a homework assignment. I would like for you to read this passage this week over and over and over again. And ask God in prayer, help my unbelief. Take me to the place where I really believe He lives in me. And that will cure you. It's curing me. It's healing me. It's freeing me. You shall know the truth, and he is the truth. And the truth will set you free. 
So if I were on my deathbed and I had a few minutes left with my sons, my daughters, grandchildren, and I would want to say to them perhaps the most important thing, I would say to them this, after all these years as a Christian, never underestimate Jesus. Because when you do, you lose. When you see him for who he is, you gain. And to have Jesus is to have everything. I want to lead us in just prayer, if I can, Brian. And I don't know if you're a believer yet in Jesus, but I know this. If you're not yet a believer, it's because you just haven't seen him yet correctly. And if you saw him this morning while I was preaching, it was because the Holy Spirit revealed him to you. And I just want to say to you this morning, if you're not a believer in Jesus, don't be afraid of him. He didn't come to hurt you. He didn't come to trap you. He didn't come to twist your life in a knot. He came to free you because he loves you. Amen? Receive him into your life. Right now, at this moment, you can just pray to him, Jesus, I don't understand you completely, but I want to receive you into my life today. On the 15th of March, 2015, Jesus, I receive you as my Savior. I prayed that kind of a prayer, simple prayer, on October 22nd, 1967, not in this building, but in the old building over on 441, and I was born into the family of God. Now, for the rest of us who are already believers in Jesus, I know that you, like me, do not have a 100% accurate understanding of who he really is. I don't either. But I want you to commit this morning that you're going to go in his direction. Amen? You're going to let him disciple you. You're going to see him walk on water. You're going to see him heal across distances. You're going to see him correct mistakes that people have made in your life and mistakes that you've made. You're going to see him open eyes. You're going to see him raised from the dead. You are going to see him active, and that is your school. It's the school of Jesus. You are going to go to this school for the rest of your life. And we'll be in that school for all of eternity because we will never exhaust him. We will never fully understand everything that he is. And I want to pray that we will all go toward him every day for the rest of our life. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you are all and you are in all of us. All of us who have received you have received you into our inner life and you live in us. And I place myself in your hands and I pray that you would draw me closer to you every single day of the rest of my life. I love you, Jesus. But I know that I do not love you as I will love you. And I was made in the, in the way I was made to love you. And so I pray that you would draw me closer to you every day. And I pray that you would do that to every single one of us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.